you want to make a big impact with your small garden space, you have come to the right place. We're joined by Susan Morrison, who's the author of The Less Is More Garden and uh, an expert in really making things pop at small spaces. First off, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Now, I, I love taking on small spaces. I think there's a kind of an artistic challenge in that. What is your kind of first approach when you, when you go in and you, you assess a small space? Well, the first part really, if I'm dealing with a new client, is to reassure them that a small space doesn't have to be limiting. Mm -hmm. And if we're redoing the whole space, then it's important to start out asking the right questions, lifestyle questions. Mm -hmm. What is it that you want to do back there? You know, don't make up your mind based on a magazine. Let's start with how you want to live and how you want to enjoy the space. And that helps us figure out what we need to be focused on and honestly, where the budget's gonna go. Right, and when we talk about small here, we're not talking about balconies. Describe the kind of spaces that you work with in the book. Well, not what I would call micro gardens, mm -hmm. which would be things like balconies and very small courtyards, but rather, you know, the reality is that I think small is the new normal. Yeah. And one of the reasons I started specializing in small spaces was because they found me, whether I wanted to find them or not. <laughs> yeah. Most people now have big houses on little lots, mm -hmm. and so, you know, a backyard that's maybe 2,000 square feet is pretty normal right now yeah yeah so one of the concepts you outline in the book is kind of having things do double duty which I would think is critical in a small space what do you mean by double duty for well when you are limited on space it's difficult to invest a lot of real estate to something that only does one thing mm -hmm. and there are a couple things that come up regularly and one of them is if you have a small garden and particularly if you like to entertain you don't want the place crowded with seating and patios but when people come over you have to have space for them so I love to take any sort of a seat wall or a retaining wall, make it 18 inches, that's the ideal height if you can, and make sure that it's got um, something on the top that's about eight inches wide, and now you have seating for you know, 10, 12, 14 people when they right. come over. And raised beds work for that too. Make sure. your raised vegetable beds 18 mm -hmm. inches tall, and you can sit there when people come over. And vegetable beds can be every bit as beautiful centerpieces in a garden as a, a, a ornamental bed. They can be, and honestly, as a gardener, they're a lot more comfortable too when you're doing the gardening if you can perch instead of exactly. bend down. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Very wise. But there are all sorts of other ways. You, the, it, the book explains about double duty. For example, accommodating children or pets or uh, other kinds of activities. Accommodating children and pets, that can be very stressful to people with small mm -hmm. gardens. For example, with dogs, the, the fear is the dog's not gonna have a place to play. Mm -hmm. And while all dogs are different, most dogs tend to have a guard dog instinct. Mm -hmm. And so in a small space, if you can make sure that they can walk a perimeter, and it doesn't have to be a perimeter around the whole garden and smart, a dedicated path. <laughs> if they can just go from the patio to the grass to a little pathway mm -hmm. and there's a space between the shrubs, your dog's probably gonna be pretty happy. Right. The, the, you know, the ideal garden to me always is a series of rooms. Mm -hmm. And even in a small space, you can do that by breaking up the, the space in different kinds of ways. What are some of your favorite strategies for that? Well, that actually is a really good point. And it, garden rooms, they're actually considered now not so in of a design style, but I still do them because I think they're fantastic. With a smaller space, instead of literally creating a wall with a hedge or a wall, what you want to do is get a sense of subtle separation. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I like to do is maybe have a curve in a patio with a focal point in between that subtly separates, here's our eating space and here's our relaxation mm -hmm. space. And if you're into plants, which of course I'm sure everyone who watches this show is, <laughs> then I also love to create an effect of a wall, but one that you can see through with what exactly. I call see-through plants. Yeah, there's a nice thing about the transparency of plants is, and it, it, you know, when you create a room, it doesn't have to mean a wall doesn't have to be exactly. a wall. Yeah, you know, it can be something that's a, just a delineation, a line in the sands, yeah. almost even. And you, and the book has filled with beautiful illustrations that capture all these different things. And one of the things I really love is the. There's an emphasis on just the paving materials and the kinds of things you use for ground cover because that too mm -hmm. can really lend to that sense of kind of adventure as you move through a space. Everything really pulls together and getting back to you mentioned double duty, mm -hmm. ground covers can do that as well because mm -hmm. one thing that works really well in a small space is scent 
because the walls of the house and the walls and the fences tend to trap it. But it doesn't just have to be vines that smell good. It can also be a really nice herby ground cover so exactly. that when you step on it, you release that scent. Yes. So with small gardens, you just have to think a little bit more creatively. Mm -hmm. well, and that includes color too, right? Yep. Using color in different kinds of ways. Describe some of the ways that you recommend to your clients. It's interesting because I gave a talk not too long ago and someone asked me, well, if I have a small garden, do I have to be really tight with my color palette? Mm -hmm. And you don't, but you do have to think about it a little bit more. Um, there's a lot of ways you can go. You can go with a monochromatic scheme, mm -hmm. which can be surprisingly lush with just mm -hmm. an emphasis on one or two colors. Right. Or you can do something more traditional and do complementary co colors. But one of the things, separate from choosing your plants, in a small space, when some of your plants are going to disappear when the weather turns cold, I always like to bring in complementary colors with pottery or with furniture or sure. with urns so you still get that year-round pop without having to have, you know, all evergreen plants in your yeah. garden. And, you know, I've seen just really spectacular spaces where they just use a really bold color and yeah. paint a retaining wall, for example, yeah. stucco and a retaining wall. I was thinking about the canopy overhead. Well, that helps mm -hmm. delineate a space. And I would think maybe in a small space, using something that is very airy, as a small tree, for example, as a way to kind of create shade, but also distinguish or create sense of cover or protection over a sitting area, for example. When you're able to do that, that is ideal. Mm -hmm. And um, honestly, being here in Austin, I am amazed by all the live oaks everywhere. I can't oh, imagine yeah. anything more beautiful. <laughs> that can be maybe a little bit too big for a small garden. Right. But yeah, anything that creates that sense of enclosure mm -hmm. and with plants over our heads and all around us. And what I tell my clients when we're starting out in a smaller space is, wherever they are in the garden, I want them to feel like the garden is hugging them. Oh, I want them to nice. feel that they're always surrounded by garden. Mm -hmm. And so that's a great way to get those different areas, but still make the whole place just feel really warm. Yeah, those gardens are places of sanctuary. Exactly. And uh, filling them with little coves and niches is a really wonderful idea. I exactly. Think. And, uh, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the tricks of the trade. Because mm -hmm. when you're dealing with those small spaces, geometry can be your friend. Yeah, it can be your friend. And it really gets back to what I said about that idea of a garden hugging you. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, linear spaces are things that people shy away from because they think that's going to be very cold. But as long as you've got a lot of lush plantings to surround those spaces, you're actually going to get a more efficient space because like this stage that we're sitting on right now with a square like this, it's set up easily for us to converse. Sometimes too many curves waste too much space. So I encourage people to let go of that idea that curves have to come from the hardscape. That mm. lushness and that feeling of a natural landscape can yeah. come from other elements instead. There's a one garden that you feature in the book that has a very Japanese aesthetic with yes. raked gravel and stone. Yes. And uh, the, pl you know, the plants are kind of sculptural punctuations in mm -hmm. a way, you know, and, and I could see that really working in a small space. Yes, that's a very specific garden. I didn't mm. design that one. Mm. And that is a representation of that homeowner's childhood, and he wanted to replicate it. Mm -hmm. And I think the designer did a fantastic idea of not making it feel cold because of all those sculptural points that are right. scattered throughout. Yeah, and yeah. sculpture can be a real thing too. You can incorporate sculpture as centerpieces or you know all sorts of different ornaments. One of the things you use are mirrors. Mm -hmm. Well, and mirrors are a little bit controversial because just like birds sometimes can fly into the windows mm. of your home, you have to be very careful. Okay. But if they are put back into the garden, not only so that they reflect back the garden like you might do with the mirror over your mantel place, but depending on how you place them, you can get that idea of a window into another garden. Mm -hmm. And there is a homeowner that I know, and she's also a designer, and she did something I think is brilliant. She, instead of hanging a mirror, she just tilted it up against the fence and she put a little grate over it. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like a child-sized door that leads oh, into a secret yeah. garden. And so <laughs> mirrors don't just have to be, okay, I'm gonna treat this like my wall inside. You can right. do some really fun things with them. That's, that's very, very cool. And, uh, and it speaks to tucking in surprises, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> this is probably one of my favorite I do call them tricks, I would call them strategies, mm -hmm. but one of the things that can be disappointing about a small garden is the feeling that in one quick look around you've seen everything there is to see. So having little things hidden along the way 
can make a big difference. It makes people want to explore, and it makes them enjoy the space more. Of course, it draws them into the garden, and it provides that little ah moment, exactly. right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, the, what a pleasure to visit with you. The book is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, one of my favorite design books that I've seen in some time. So uh, thanks so much for stopping by Central Texas Gardener. Thank you for having me. It's been right. great. And thank you, Susan. And coming up next, it's our front deck. Mm -hmm.